Thanks, Terry. That's CGTN's Terry Terashima reporting from Tokyo. Well, there is much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. John Sitalides is a geopolitical strategist and consultant to the U.S. State Department. Joining us from Beijing is political and economic affairs commentator Aina Tangan. Shihoko Goto is the deputy director for geoeconomics and a senior Northeast Asia associate at the Wilson Center right here in Washington, D.C. And Yoshikazu Kato is an adjunct associate professor at the University of Hong Kong's Asia Global Institute and a research fellow at the Chaha Institute. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Shihoko, let me start with you. As we heard in that report there, there are many differences uh, on key policy issues between Japan and the United States. Uh, our reporter mentioned bilateral trade, the DPRK, Iran as well. So in your view, what did this visit achieve? It achieved what it ultimately set out to achieve, that is to say, to demonstrate that the United States and Japan are together in a world, especially in Asia, that is fraught with tension. So on the diplomatic front, sending that signal of close, close ties has been made. But as you said, on the policy front, we haven't seen any breakthrough. We weren't expecting any, but in actual fact, tensions are actually increasing. So more symbolism than substance then? Unfortunately, yes. All right, let me go to Anna Tangan. Anna, uh, we're looking at some of the reports here in the United States on this visit. Some of the U.S. media are describing the visit as an attempt by President Trump to get on better terms with Japan as a counterbalance to China. Uh, do you see it that way as well? Well, if that was the intention, I don't think he necessarily got where he wanted to be. I mean, he was uh, physically in Japan, but he, stuck, he was somehow stuck in the Twitterverse. Uh, almost all of his time was spent uh, on domestic issues, whether it was attacking Biden, the Democrats, Mueller report, uh, taking side swipes, in, even in press conferences at some of his own staff, all on domestic issues, bringing those issues actually into the press conferences with Abe. Um, this is, you know, diplomatically something you don't do. It's kind of the, the bull in the diplomacy shop. Uh, it's just uh, unheard of. So I think most people who were in the diplomatic community, at least, were aghast that he was uh, making so many faux pas. John, Ina Tangan has a point there, isn't it? President Trump was there physically, but if you look at the statements he made, if you look at what he was focusing on, it was very much issues back home. Maybe one would call President Trump a multitasker. Um, yes, he probably could use a little bit more discipline on the tweets, and they were very distracting and uh, clickbait for a lot of the media. But I actually think that a good amount of substantive policy achievement was had here. Uh, and certainly from Prime Minister Abe's position, the fact that there's now a, a robust implementation of a program for an, a free and open Indo-Pacific region that brings together the U.S. and Japanese militaries with that of the ASEAN countries, with France, the U.K., India, and Australia, I think may be of concern to China because this is going to be the great issue. How does the U.S balance its relations with the number two and the number three economies in the world. But that was certainly a major achievement, I think, for Prime Minister Abe. I think you also see preparations here for what will be a key meeting between Prime Minister Abe and Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, in the weeks ahead. And also, of course, preparations for the G20 summit, the first time ever held in Japan. Uh, the trade agenda, yeah, will there be a deal in August? Who knows? This could just be Trumpian negotiations. Yeah, just one work. point on the trade relationship, yes. John. It seems to be really ambivalent. On the one hand, President Trump uh, wants to increase the volume of uh, imports from mm -hmm. Japan uh, to address the trade imbalance. But at the same time, he's threatening Japan, a key U.S. ally, with trade tariffs on its auto and auto parts exports. Well, it, I'll, I'll allude to what your, uh, the previous panelist just said. He is certainly not a diplomat in the traditional sense that we've been accustomed to. And I think one of the mistakes that we make two and a half years into the Trump presidency, we keep expecting him to fit into a presidential box. He refuses to do so. He will do things the way he's done successfully for decades as a developer, as a businessman. And it's very difficult for Americans, for political leaders here, and especially for our allies and our adversaries around the world to understand him and to put him in a box. All right, let's bring in Yoshi. He's in Hong Kong. And Yoshi, this is what Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said about yeah. trade relations between the two countries. Uh, let's listen. Trump 
Since President Trump came into office, Japanese companies made investments in the United States totaling $24 billion, thereby creating 45,000 new jobs. Japanese automotive and energy companies are making investments in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Alabama, Kentucky and other U.S. states. It's been only a month since the last summer talks, but in that short time, Japanese companies have increased investments in the United States by $1 billion. So, Yoshi, that's a massive increase in Japanese investments. He was talking about those investments in just one month there. What is the Japanese strategy here to placate these complaints that we're hearing from uh, President Trump about the trade imbalance? Uh, I think, of course, Japanese companies and Japanese government are making great efforts on you know, strengthening Japan U.S. economic ties. But at, at the same time, you know, we have to focus on str uh, strategic and security ties. <laughs> So now that Mr. Trump is you know, looking like you know, more you know, you know, in more looking and you know, uh, conservative policy in Asia Pacific. So now Shinzo Abe is trying to complement, uh, implement more comprehensive you know, policies you know, to combine the economic relations with strategic and security relations. So now uh, Shinzo Abe needs some help from Mr. Trump because now Japan is going to host the G20 summit in Osaka very soon. And now Shinzo Abe makes the very point of the nuclear issue you know, with uh, North Korea and DPRK, uh, abduction issues. So now Shinzo Abe needs some help from Mr. Trump. So that's why you know, this time you know, Trump looks like very symbolic rather than substance. So I think this is a very critical point and time uh, for Mr. Abe to tackle these issues. And he needs some help. And that's why he needs some strength and emphasis on, you know, U.S.-Japan alliance and friendship, and even some personal relationship you know, to, through playing golf, you know, uh, watching small together. So this is a very critical point and moment. All right, I want to get to that DPRK issue in a moment, but Shihoko, I want to get your view on this. How much concern is there in Japan on the possibility that the United States could impose uh, these tariffs uh, if there is no trade deal? And as John pointed out, uh, John pointed out a moment ago. It's highly unlikely. It, it is a tremendous risk for Japan. One of the things that Abe really wants to do is to make sure that the Japanese car uh, industry is sheltered from tariffs, the Section 232 mm -hmm. uh, tariffs, invoking national security. Um, Japanese steel and aluminium products are already hit hard with that. When, when, you, when the United States says national security, this is a U.S. ally. Right. And so the, the Japanese are, are very frustrated. And I would like to argue that we've seen a bit of change in the rhetoric from the Japanese companies themselves. And I'm thinking in particular about Toyota, which is the biggest of the Japanese car makers. And they came out front and center and said, we feel now that our investments are our commitments to the United States in investing in the United States is not welcome. And Japan is the third largest provider of FDI, foreign direct investment, into the United States. And companies are beginning to consider, you know, on a global level, yes, the American market is incredibly important, but the country risk of the United States is actually going up. Do they really want to continue investing in the United States, or should they go elsewhere like Southeast Asia? So we're seeing a bit of a mind, sh uh, mind uh, a shift in the mindset, and companies are beginning to vocalize that as well. John, is that a risk for the United States? It is. Anytime you enter into these types of very high stakes trade negotiations, mm -hmm. there are risks to be had. And to your point, Anand, uh, the United States under President Trump has also declared uh, auto imports from Germany to be a possible national security Another risk. Ally. <laughs> Again, you know, it's simply a matter of redefining the way politics and international relations are conducted. And some of this has been successful. Some of it remains to be seen, especially with U.S.-China. That is probably the biggest game in town. Mm -hmm. But U.S.-Japan is an extraordinarily important relationship for the United States from a trade and commercial perspective, from a military perspective. It's enormously important for the United States and for our Pacific allies also to make sure that U.S., China, and Japan are able to work towards common objectives without miscalculation that could lead to conflict. All right, Anna Tangan, President Trump says that any trade deal with Japan will have to wait until uh, after the uh, parliamentary elections in Japan. That takes place in July. This is what President Trump said. Let's listen. Trade-wise, I think uh, we will be announcing some things probably in August that will be very good for both countries. We have to do a little catching up with Japan because they've been doing much more business 
with us. We'd like to do a little bit more business in the reverse. The balance will we'll get the balance of trade, I think, straightened out rapidly. So, Anatang, and here's the thing here, a bit of optimism there from President Trump. But what we don't know is what the Japanese have to do to stave off these tariffs that the president has been threatening. And do you think under those circumstances, with the possibility of tariffs being imposed, that a trade deal can be struck? Well, I, I think a trade deal uh, will be attempted. The, the issue is, as I said, at this point, uh, Shinzo Abe believes that, or Abe Shinzo believes that Trump, uh, he needs Trump's help. So right now it's appeasement. He's looking forward, I think, as are most of the world, at a post-Trump world. It is fine to say that uh, Donald Trump defies the box, but that's like saying my drunk uncle always does something weird at, at Thanksgiving. Uh, and the issue here is reliability. Uh, we've already heard that there's real questions about political risk of investing in the United States. These things are going to hurt the U.S. long term. You start pushing uh, these companies away, and they, it's very hard to bring them back. John, you want to talk about Anna Tangan's drunk uncle? Well, a few things, <laughs> yeah. So regarding the drunk uncle, that may be uh, yeah. quite analogous in some respects, but uh, President Trump is president of the United States, and so this is where he is, and the world has to deal with this. There's just no way around this. So all the jokes aside, this is a man who is setting the pace for U.S. leadership today and possibly for years and decades to come, depending on the outcome of these very important trade negotiations. I do want to emphasize one of the points that the co-panelists made about the possibility that President Trump is putting leaders like Prime Minister Abe in a very difficult position because this isn't just a matter of U.S. politics, but they have domestic politics as well. And how does Shinzo Abe go back to the parliament and to the Japanese people without looking like he's condescending? to the U.S. president, and you have a very proud people that want to make sure that their leaders uphold a sense of national pride in the course of these negotiations. Right. That's a very high-risk type of proposition from President Trump, unfortunately. Yoshiha, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to add, um, Japan is paying the price for the United States withdrawing from the TPP, the Trump-specific um, partnership agreement. Why is that? Um, the United States is losing market share in Japan, right. especially in the agricultural front, because Australia, New Zealand, Canada, other Canada mm -hmm. all of these other TPP member countries are really um, taking advantage of low to no tariffs on their imports. Japan's also signed a free trade agreement with the EU. Now it's got access to cheaper foods and wines from France, from, from Germany, um, for now, um, the UK, and um, not, and um, it, it is a, a problem um, for Japan to say we will be able to um, make way for America. That the concession that Japan will make is up to the TPP level. Right. Then we will be able to agree to a bilateral agreement. So in a sense then, Yoshiko, if Japan is making these deals with big agricultural producers, like you mentioned, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, the pressure is on the US because it's, once it starts losing market share, it's going to have to sell that, uh, sign that trade agreement. Right. So we've already seen that the United States is trying to compensate for some of the losses that the American agricultural producers are having right. as a result of the US-China trade friction. Will that compensation have to accelerate even further? I believe that why Trump is saying this August deadline right now is for his own political reasons, that he is under a lot of pressure from American agricultural producers right. in particular. And if they don't step up to that, Americans keep on losing market share in Japan and elsewhere. Yoshi, I want to get back to a point John mentioned a moment ago, and that is the kind of domestic pressure that Shinzo Abe uh, is under in Japan, uh, especially after this visit with Trump. Uh, yes, yeah, so this time on Trump's visit to Japan, it looked like, you know, uh, symbolic, and, but at the same time, it's very political, you know, very, you know, high po politics oriented. And actually now, Shinzo Abe and Donald Trump, uh, both of the two need some political assets. Uh, to you know, exercise their leadership. So it, it, it's kind of show. So now Shinzo Abe is focusing on the, our election in July. So now they, he needs he needs some approval from the public opinion and market side. That's why you know they have maybe they have some chem chemistry between the two. But now you know that the issue is more substantial, like right? North Korea and, and trade. So now you know, as my Japanese colleague said, you know, now the United States is losing some shares in Japanese market. So uh, you know, so this this very substantial issue are somehow you know backward. 
So uh, it's very important time to because now for Japan now we are going to host the G20 summit. So and including the U.S.-China trade war or some of the world economy or geopolitical issues in in the Asia Pacific. So now Shinzo Abe needs more you know substantially focus and raise up some questions uh, in order to exercise the leadership beyond the U.S.-Japan alliance. Go ahead, John. I think well, much credit goes to Prime Minister Abe also for looking to bridge, as we're talking about now, some of his domestic uh, political mm. concerns with the need to provide some type of a concession to President Trump. And I think you see that in the form of the announcement that they're going to purchase more than 100 F-35 fighter jets. That's a $10 billion deal. That's a feather in President Trump's cap. Well, at the same time, the Japanese are concerned about some of the growing tensions with North Korea, some of the issues with China. And so the Japanese people are looking to beef up their defense right. capabilities, at the same time providing President Trump a major military arms sale announcement back home. Right. Aina Tang, let me get your view on that. Uh, the uh, more than 100 U.S. manufactured fighter aircraft that Japan will buy from uh, the United States or plans to buy, uh, as John pointed out, it will go some way towards addressing that trade imbalance. But trade aside, um, what is the significance of that purchase by Japan in the region? Well, of course, you know, China will be very interested. Uh, it, it seems to be ratcheting up this idea that there are more arms sales. If you look at the arms sales from uh, year to year, ever since Donald Trump has become president, the arms sales has gone through the roof. He has a very predictable pattern. Wherever he goes, he announces some sort of arms sale, whether it's Saudi Arabia or any other country. Uh, he's very anxious to show that he's the greatest salesman in the world, but I don't think you achieve peace through weapons. All right, Shihoko, uh, let's move on to another big issue, which uh, Yoshi mentioned earlier on, uh, and that is the DPRK, or North Korea. Now, President Trump acknowledges that there are advisors in his administration um, who think that these recent launches by the DPRK, ballistic uh, missile launches, uh, violated UN resolutions. Uh, but he personally, President Trump says, I don't think so. This is what he had to say. Let's watch. My people think it could have been a violation, as you know. I view it differently. I view it as a man. Perhaps he wants to get attention, and perhaps not. Who knows? It doesn't matter. All I know is that there have been no nuclear tests. There have been no ballistic missiles going out. There have been no long-range missiles going out. And I think that someday we'll have a deal. You're not bothered at all by the small missiles? No, I'm not. I am personally not. So clearly differences in the White House over these launches, but how much concern is there in Japan over that? To say that Japan is concerned would be a great understatement. Mm -hmm. The confusion from within the administration, within his cabinet, um, about the threat of North Korea is confusing for the Japanese. And it obviously does not share Trump's own um, analysis of the situation. For Japan, the policy of maximum pressure was really ideal. And it really does want to continue to take a hardline stance against North Korea, in particular because the threat is very real from a geographic perspective. Um, Japan is very much in the, in the crosshair of uh, the wrath of North Korea, and the United States is not necessarily um, sharing that concern. Yoshi, uh, Prime Minister Abe is the only uh, leader in the region who's not met with the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Uh, but President Trump has now given his backing to a possible visit by Shinzo Abe uh, to meet with Kim Jong-un. Do you think that'll happen? And if it happens, what can we expect from that? Uh, so at this moment, Shinzo Abe is moving forward. Uh, you know, whether this is good or bad, you know, he said, you know, I I'm ready for meeting uh, with Kim Jong-un unconditionally. Uh, this has never happened, you know, say unconditionally. So this means Japan needs more action, even without U.S. help. I agree, you know, maybe in the United States, Mr. Trump particularly, he, he does not share these concerns, very strategic and dangerous, you know, risks uh, with Japan, even though Japan U.S. alliance are, you know, look, look, looks like strengthened. So it's uh, maybe for Shinzo Abe, uh, he, he very, you know, makes a point of this issue, I mean, abduction issue politically. So now Shinzo Abe is moving forward, but the problem is how, how to coordinate you know, this strategy with the United States and, of course, China, Russia. So now it's a very critical time for Japan to how to tackle this, uh, the North Korea issue comprehensively, and because this is very important for Japan, both in domestic politics and, of course, national security and the safety of the Japanese citizen. 
Aina Tengen, as uh, Shihoko just pointed out, uh, Japan has a lot more at stake here because of its proximity to the DPRK. What do you think a meeting between uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and Kim Jong-un could achieve? Well, I, I don't know what would be in it for uh, Kim, quite frankly. I mean, there's, there's nothing uh, that he can do with Japan. Japan will simply ask for their hostages back, and they probably won't get it, or if it would be very uh, symbolic at best. I mean, Shinzo Abe, I don't, Abe Shinzo does not necessarily have anything to gain uh, by going to uh, North Korea. So at this point, it doesn't seem uh, rational that there will be any kind of hope in the near future. Remember, this trip was about two issues. Uh, initially, it was about you know, pomp and circumstances, the greatest honor that the Japanese confer. You would be the first to greet the new emperor. And the trade and security issues came up. And on both, si both of those issues, there was a complete failure, a miscommunication. On trade, Donald Trump wanted to have his cake and eat it too. TPP, he withdrew from it. Now he wants the same benefits as if he wanted to join. On the uh, military front, he got the big order for the uh, air warplanes, but he wasn't willing to reassure uh, a valuable ally that he would protect them against an imminent threat. John, what are we to make of the fact that there are these differences in the White House? On the one hand, you've got White House uh, aides to President Trump who are saying, well, this is serious business. This could be a violation. These launches I'm talking about uh, from North Korea, these could be violations of UN resolutions. President Trump saying, no, it's not that a big deal. It's just some guy trying to get attention. President Trump seems to have an inordinate confidence in his ability to personally cajole Kim Jong-un towards complete denuclearization. Most people on the outside don't see how this happens. And I think that concern is also shared by many of his top advisors. Question is, is there another way to deal with both the intercontinental ballistic missile threat to the United States and also reassure allies such as Japan and South Korea in the event of a smaller scale conflict or the uh, smaller range, the lesser range missile threat from North Korea? But President Trump is supreme, supremely confident in his abilities. And until Kim Jong-un is able to convince him otherwise, but you know, with all of the personality issues that come into play here, the U.S. under President Trump has not let up at all on maximum pressure. I mean, that's the one thing that Kim Jong-un is screaming for relief on, and he's not getting any of that. All of this maybe is somewhat symbolic and very confusing to those of us who are used to dealing with a Kim Jong-un type leader very differently than President Trump has. Again, rewriting the rules for better or for worse. But the maximum pressure is on, and I think it's going to remain relentless for the foreseeable future. Shioko, in our final minutes, one other issue. Japanese media reporting that Iran would like Japan to mediate between uh, the United States and itself. Uh, we've seen these tensions that have been rising over the past few months. Uh, Japan, of course, has uh, an interest in diffusing tensions between the United States because it buys oil from Iran. Uh, right now, it can't do that because of U.S. sanctions. Um, Abe is thinking of traveling to Iran. Can you see that happening? Well, the Iranian foreign minister actually went to Japan mm -hmm. um, a few days ago yeah. um, in hopes that the um, Japanese leadership would be able to articulate some of our, Iran's concerns. And there's expectations, certainly on the Iranian side, that Japan could play a more uh, mediation, mediatory role in, in this. Um, and Abe himself would certainly want to take on that role, um, obviously for economic and security reasons, but also from his personal legacy perspective as mm. well, to have that kind of legacy of global leadership. Yoshi, what is your view? Can Japan uh, bring down these tensions between the U.S. and Iran? Oh, of course. Hopefully, you know, Japan can do that uh, between the two. Because now, actually, Japan and Iran has been more, you know, in friendship and relatively, you know, good relation uh, uh, over the time. So since Abe is now, and now he is trying to uh, make a bridge between the U.S. and Iran, and and strengthen and expand our influence in the right. Middle East and and, and beyond. So uh, you know, hopefully, uh, this is going to happen. Okay, that's where we have to leave it. We have run out of time. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. But before we go, a reminder to check out our podcast. You can listen through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. We'll be covering similar stories from around the world that we do right here on the program. So check it out and subscribe. Search online for CGTN and The Heat Podcast. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.